Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and I'm here with Frederike Ernst. And today we're going to speak with Alex Lukowski. He is the co-founder and CEO of Matter Labs. And Matter Labs is the, the company that's building ZK Sync, which is one of the most uh, exciting and uh, sort of largest uh, ZK roll-up technologies. Uh, that's you know looking to scale Ethereum by kind of maintaining all the Ethereum's trust assumptions and you know bring freedom to people all over the world. So thanks so much for joining us, Alex. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So uh, we had you on like two years ago, and uh, you know a lot has happened since then, including the zk space having gotten you know lots of traction, lots of interest. It's still an area that's you know, hard for a lot of people to sort of understand and wrap their head around, even people working crypto. So I felt like maybe we can start with, you know, just a very brief recap of, you know, what are ZK rollups and, you know, why is ZK such a great technology to scale blockchains? Uh, absolutely, let me try. So with blockchains, uh, uh, you know, like the, yeah, we really observe the revolution, the, the cost starting with Bitcoin and, and Ethereum, taking it to the next level of smart contracts and all the pro programmability of money, interactions, value. Like really, this is, to me, it, it, it's the continuation of the internet revolution, but it's a quantum leap. It's, it's a jump from web 2.0 to web 3.0, like adding value to the internet on transaction level. Uh, the problem is that the very same properties that make things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, decentralized blockchains valuable, uh, they also lead to, to the difficulties in making it available to, to a lot of people. There are some key things, uh, in my opinion, that we can distill this value to. Uh, among them are trustlessness, permissionlessness, openness, and like, full absolute inclusivity of, of these networks. And to achieve that, um, in the blockchain world from the early days, we embrace the maxima of don't trust, verify. So essentially everyone has to verify all the transactions, all of the activity that's happening on chain. And you can think of blockchains as the social economic systems, but in the essence, what's happening under the hood, those are just computing systems. So Ethereum is really, Ethereum started with the narrative of being a world computer. And it's what Ethereum really is if you look at it from the computer science angle. So uh, that means everyone has to redo all of the computations for everyone else, which leads to quadratic complexity of uh, communication, storage, computational requirements. And it's just infeasible to bring it to the world. You know, like you, 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 when you uh, are scaling the internet and adding a value layer onto the internet, uh, you can't rerun the computation of all the other servers, of all the other, you know, like, it, like redo everything that everyone else is doing. So, like, the, 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 this is a fundamental limitation which people have tried to solve in, uh, with different trade offs, always leaving some parts of this value proposition severely damaged. Like either you give up decentralization or you give up security or you give up some, some other important properties. Uh, and it was not until zero knowledge proofs appear that we found a fundamental solution to this. So like we, we came up earlier, the community came up with some really ingenious ways to, uh, to make this trade-offs in a, um, in a limited way, you know, like we experimented with things like state channels, payment channels, uh, plasma, which then transitioned into like optimistic rollups. All those things were important steps on this journey, but the ultimate destination is zero knowledge proofs. To explain why, zero knowledge proofs are specifically, like more, more precisely, succinct zero knowledge proofs or SNARKs um, are in fact, they would be better called like proofs of computational integrity. They allow you to verify arbitrary amount of uh, computation very cheaply. It doesn't matter how much original computation you do, how much it would take you to naively recompute. You can let someone do the hard work for you and then only present you with a final proof, which is going to be a short file, like one kilobyte or 
maybe a few kilobytes of data that you can uh, process using very simple arithmetic operations uh, and come to back to result, whether it's true or, or false. And uh, the beauty of it, you can combine various zero knowledge proofs recursively. So you can do a lot of computation in parallel and then like verify them, uh, produce a proof that you verified some proofs then verify these proofs of proofs and so on until you get to this one single proof which attests to the integrity of all the computation that you managed to um, to back in there. And then you settle this on something like Ethereum as a global settlement layer, a global layer of consensus where we all agree, okay, this is the last state. And this enables us to scale blockchains basically indefinitely. And just um, let's say if I'm to verify all of these proofs, then I need to know what is being proved though, no? So if there's like a huge chain of all kinds of computation, I still need to know like, you know, all of the things you are comp computing, even if I don't have to do the computations. You don't have to know all of these things. You only need to commitment. Like we, in, in, uh, uh, in cryptography, in the world of blockchains, we have a really nice primitive called commitment where you can have a single hash that kind of is a fingerprint of, of multiple things. Like usually we pack it in the Merkle tree and you have uh, a lot of uh, leaves at the bottom of the Merkle tree. And then you have one hash, the root hash of this Merkle tree, which will change, like which is an unambiguous representation of all of the data that, that is committed in this tree. If you have to change one of the leaves, this hash will necessarily change. And it's really, really hard, computationally infeasible, to find, like to fake it, to find some hash that will correspond to the set that you want. Uh, so in, in this regard, uh, you don't have to know all of the things that's happening computationally there. You only have to know that whatever you are verifying has a subset which is of interest to you. So like I, uh, I was recently thinking that the best way to describe zero knowledge proofs in the blockchain context would be to call them not zero knowledge proofs, but like partial knowledge proofs, where you can only look at things that that, that are important to you, but you, you still have the full picture and you know that everything else that you currently don't care about is also still correctly verified. So a, a good example of this to intuitively understand this, um, and you can you can calibrate me to let me go deeper in, into tech or, or more high level in this interview, but the an intuitive understanding uh, for people out there would be Imagine you're getting, you're receiving a payment on PayPal or Venmo or, or your bank account. You will see that your account balance has increased. You might want to see who is this payment coming from. And you don't care about all the other accounts in the world. You still want to be sure that all the other accounts in your, in, at least in your bank are correctly managed, that all the other payments are done with high integrity. Because if that's not the case, Maybe your account is increased, but like all the other accounts are increased by $1 million. And so the bank is really insolvent and it will be, won't be able to, to pay you this money. When you go to the shop with your credit card, you won't be able to make a payment. Right? So you don't care about those computations, but you still want them to be, ver uh, to be, uh, to be correct. So like zero knowledge proofs would allow you to verify the integrity of all the other payments without having to care about them. And the way we implement zero knowledge proofs in the world of blockchains, we, the way we apply them to blockchains today on Ethereum is by building ZK rollups. And so we can we can talk about what ZK rollup actually is. Yes, let's do that. So in a ZK uh, rollup, um, who produces um, the the ZK proofs and um, kind of what's what's the mechanism end to end? Sure. So a ZK rollup is a layer two scaling solution. So instead of transacting directly on layer one, on Ethereum, on the mainnet itself, we say, let's create a uh, parallel blockchain that uh, that it w is going to process transactions completely separately. So like we will have uh, someone, some entity, or maybe decentralized body of entities that will accept transactions and will sequence them in blocks. We'll call this body sequencer. It can be centralized, run by one server, can be decentralized, run by consensus of multiple validators. Doesn't matter. Like, but let's just assume we have this one blockchain. So the sequencer collects transactions, packs them into blocks, verifies that they're they're valid. Like tries to like you know, 
if the blocks are invalid, they won't be able to produce the proofs. And after the blocks are complete, they do two things. One is they compute the zero knowledge proofs for all the transactions in the block. And they produce a final proof that this block is complete. To make it practical, it probably requires still recursive proof generation. So we will split this block into small, many small multiple chunks. We'll produce the proof for each of the chunk. Maybe we'll, we'll move heavy operations into specialized zero knowledge proofs that are more efficiently verifiable than generic purpose transactions. We'll produce the proof of that. Then we will aggregate all these proofs together in one single proof of the block, which, which contains like all the, all the logic that verifies all the logic that we need. The tra transactions were done correctly, that the user is authorized, and with signatures that smart contract logic executed uh, correctly, and then all, all the hashes, like we, we can, like basically all the computation, right? We have this one proof. And then this proof is submitted on layer one uh, along with the new root hash for this block. So we don't publish the entire state, we don't publish all the transactions, we just say, here is the new state, here is the new commitment to the state, the new root hash. And here's a proof that the new, this new root hash is indeed a valid transition from the previous root hash, the previous commitment to the state, which is recorded on layer one to this new root hash. And layer one, the smart contract on Ethereum can actually verify this proof, come to conclusion objectively by nature of pure math verification that the proof is correct and make the state transition. And then we need the second thing. We need to make sure that even though the state transition is now validly verified on, 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 on layer one and, and the transition is made and we have the new root hash of the state, everyone else knows what actually happened in this block. It was specifically with regard to like what, what is the new state of all the accounts in the block. Because if people don't know it, if external observers, the users or the, um, the other validators don't know what, what, what changed in the state, they will not be able to do anything with it. Like we will enter a, uh, a state which is committed on Ethereum uh, that no one except for, the, for whoever made this transition can actually process. I cannot prove to you that I have money. I cannot access this money. I cannot withdraw. I cannot transact on this chain. So it would be like a frozen state. So uh, in order to, to solve this, we have to publish something to the users, to everyone, who, is, who wants to observe, need to publish some piece of information that will allow them to reconstruct the state or to reconstruct the changes that happened in the state from the previous known state. So there are two ways to do it. Like one is you publish all the transaction inputs and you just like make it available to everyone. And then people can recompute these transactions and reconstruct the state, which is something the optimistic rollups do. Uh, and the second approach is that you publish the actual differences for each storage slot that has been changed in this rollup block, you publish the new state of the storage slot. Either way, the observer now can reconstruct the state and they can like, work with, with, the, uh, with the new block. But the trick is we have to publish it on some really strong censorship-resistant uh, system. And the most censorship-resistant we have uh, is Ethereum itself. So we kind of abuse Ethereum network to to make this this data available. We call it the data availability and the ultimate vision for Ethereum to be the settlement and the data availability layer for rollups, making rollups the center of Ethereum roadmap and really the place where all where most of the activity on, on Ethereum will happen. Cool. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. Let me maybe recap this. So basically from a technical point of view, um, what a ZK rollup um, requires is full forward. So you need regular checkpoints on L1 that can't revert. You need a proof of correctness from checkpoint to checkpoint. You need data availability um, on L1, uh, either directly by call data or kind of in, in the dank sharding world in the in the sidecar blobs. The first thing is you need kind of you need forced inclusion. Um, and basically that the next checkpoint is only valid if forced inclusions are provably part of the next checkpoint, right? So we, we will kind of, we will go into this <laughs> in just a little bit um, to kind of discuss kind of the recent um, developments in kind of the Validium world and so on to kind of lo look at the entire spectrum of kind of um, shades of L2. Um, but maybe before that, 
kind of let's let's quickly talk about um, the newly launched CK Sync 2.0 because that kind of that came out recently. So now that we kind of know um, how a CK rollups function um, theoretically, let's uh, get down to the meaty part. So what's new with uh, with uh, ZK Sync 2.0? Well, ZK Sync 2.0, which we call ZK Sync Era, is not such a recent development. We launched it half a year ago, live in Mainnet. And it was the very first ZK AVM, the very first uh, ZK rollup with uh, generic programmability that could execute contracts written for Solidity, or in Solidity for AVM. So you could take a contract that, that works on Ethereum and you just deploy it and it, it works out of the box in, in most cases. And all the tooling works, uh, or like not not all the tooling works, but like m m the, the critical pieces work, like the uh, uh, Web3 API, the, uh, the the testing, the deploying, the access to it, like logs. Everything follows the uh, EVM programming model. And yeah, since then we we experienced a lot of uh, growth on the platform, and it's in fact now the the most popular. L2 on Ethereum. We had uh, more transactions in the last 30 days than any other uh, L2 with, uh, I think, 25 million transactions with Arbitrum following with 24 and Optimism with 16 million and everyone else uh, way below. Uh, and it's currently the third um, L2 by TVL and, and, and it's also growing, fluctuating, but the DeFi component is growing very strongly and we have more and more projects launching on on ERA, so um, uh, ERA, yeah, it's um, uh, it's a big step for Ethereum. It's you know, like it's it, it, it's what people were waiting for many years and and thought it will take many more years to arrive in in the full form. L let's kind of look at the taxonomy of different CK rollups, right? So basically, it's a space that has grown, you know, leaps and bounds in recent years. Um, and even on this pod podcast, we, we we recently interviewed um, Jordi and David from ZK EVM at um, Polygon. We spoke with um, Ellie from Stark, um, with um, Zach and Joe from Aztec. Um, but there's also other people we haven't had on the podcast yet, like uh, the Scroll team, the Linear team, and so on. Do you have a taxonomy in your head for these different ZK rollups? So basically, what kind of buckets do they fall into? Vitalik came up with this post uh, introducing different types of uh, of ZK AVMs. I'm not sure it will be relevant uh, in this in in the like, midterm. Like it probably relevant still relevant now, but we're in a very early experimentational phase. So, in in that post, he broke it down into um, essentially degrees of closeness to the original Ethereum specification. Like how how um, how far do we deviate? from like pure native um, layer one EVM. Different ZK AVMs have, uh, you know, like some of them embrace the bytecode native approach, some of them embrace uh, compiling, some, some, some are somewhere in between. Uh, some of them are trying to be as close to layer one as uh, to replicate the full blocks of layer one and, and let uh, storage uh, be kept in exactly the same format. So uh, looking at this, I think this classification is is going to disappear in the short future because the productivity of zero knowledge proofs is accelerating still at a at a really high pace, and so the performance characteristics will uh, allow us to basically verify like, arbitrary computations. So we will be able in in the very short term we will be able to run. ZKVM, like you know, like specialized programs compiled from Solidity to to a, a ZKVM, which is optimal for proving, or prove the bytecode native uh, EVM, and like maybe even like have storage proofs for uh, for the exact same format as, as Ethereum, uh, or we will be able to write uh, to run like native code written in Rust or C plus plus, all of that on the same platform. So you as a builder will have a choice of what type of uh, of computational environment you want. For some applications, you might want to run bytecode compatible EVM. Just, you know, like, there are use cases like you want to deploy the address, the contract which has exactly the same address as, as 
on all the other AVM chains, right? So you have no choice but to deploy native uh, native code there. But for some other use cases, you want a hundred thousand uh, TPS uh, DEX optimized for a very specific operation. You can't really do it in in, in EVM. You can do it because your your sequencer is going to be at the bottleneck. So you will probably write a specialized app specific application in Rust that just does that, and you may might want to deploy it as a as a ZK rollup because you still want all the benefits of uh, interoperability and, and security that you derive from ZK rollup, but you will probably not do it in EVM. And you still want a platform that can that enables you to incorporate all of these designs. And so I think the real taxonomy is gonna be the like this architecture of interoperability between the chains. So it's it's something we re- recently came up with uh, the uh, publication of the ZK stack. That, that allows you to, to deploy your own chain. And the architecture of hyper chains and hyper bridges that connect them it will, will allow you to have this like different types of infrastructures deployed in the interconnected way. So I think that that's that's gonna be like one major classificator, like how different raw ecosystems approach this uh, application specific design and interoperability between them, and like whether or not they can make it seamless and native. And the second big um, classification uh, parameter that I would pick is the uh, treating of data availability. Do you publish the, the transaction inputs or do you publish the state diffs? In what way do we enable volition or is it a single data availability model that you can only be a ZK rollup or only be a validium? This is going to be a big important a difference. So those, those two things I think are matter much more than the degree of compatibility because that the compatibility is going to be solved in Let's talk about um, the first complex of questions first, and then kind of the uh, the validium kind of spectrum later. So we had Ellie on recently, and he was very adamant um, that um, zk EVMs are not performant enough, and basically they don't offer. Basically, in terms of kind of how much computation you can do, um, he says that that Cairo is is doing much much better. But it sounds like you're saying that in principle you can kind of mesh these two approaches. Did I get that right, or did did I misunderstand? This is absolutely correct. Yeah. So like I agree with Ali that EVM is not the most performant platform, especially for sequential operations. So you can you could construct an EVM that verifies transactions in parallel, and then even though uh, the uh, like the performance of these transactions is not at the limit of what what the current compute is enabling you, you kind of don't care because what you care about is the cost per transaction. And if the cost is much, much less than the uh, uh, what the user is willing to pay, think of like payment applications, like if you're or you know some some import some trading uh, where your margin is like some a few dollars per transaction, but you're only paying 0.0001 cent, you probably don't care. Like what you care about is security. Uh, you care about interoperability and you care about time to market. And if time to market is important, you probably, and you're building smart contracts, you want to tap into a rich existing ecosystem. You want to be building on, on something like Solidity that has a lot of libraries, a lot of frameworks, a lot of tooling, a lot of people who know how to build it because it, it's already hard to hire Solidity developers. How hard would it be to hire uh, people who, who have to learn some specialized language? Yeah. So, you, you, like, you want this rich, broad ecosystem to, to to be building your stuff on. However, for other applications, for like what some something that like uh, this hundred k TPS uh, uh, exchange, you absolutely need the uh, the uh, the ultimate compute. You want you want to like bring it down to you you probably maybe you don't even want to run it inside a virtual machine like no matter if it's Cairo VM or EVM or whatever maybe you want like really like a bare metal implementation of your specific rollup that can settle transactions and really really fast running like because all of them are sequential because they are trading on the same trading pair you want to run them like as as fast as possible what the processor enables you. So you get to this ultra high frequency trading with tens or hundreds of thousands of TPS. So yes, I believe the the, the future is with with this differentiated spectrum of approaches. 
cool. That's that's very helpful. I I, I want to like understand this like a little bit more. So let's say you have the the EVM today on Ethereum, right? With the EVM, basically, uh, you know, there are some uh, performance limitations. You know, I mean. For example, one is okay because of the consensus. You have to like propagate the blocks. Like you know, it requires a certain amount of block time. You can't make them too massive. Uh, another thing is maybe the the kind of computation of the state in the EVM. Now we have the zk EVM here. What becomes a bottleneck here, right? Because you have a single sequencer that you send a transaction to. It's basically the bottleneck, the speed at which you're able to create the proofs for for all the transactions or how, I mean first of all how, how does the the sca- the throughput and scalability of you know one single CK EVM compare to Ethereum mainnet and what what are the bottlenecks there? Uh, that's a really great question. So we will have a couple of bottlenecks. The first and immediate bottleneck is going to be the speed of your sequencer. At the, the pace at which you can accept and execute transactions and, and compute the block, intermediate block results and block hashes. This does not depend on uh, the, you know, like whatever, what zero knowledge proofs or, or fraud proofs you're using. It does not depend on data availability. It, it just basic computation and networking. And it depends on the architecture of your chain. Some chains will be decentralized and so you will have to tap into, into consensus and you have to, to like also make sure that your sequencing layer is fast enough and like your latency is, is good enough for your application. Um, some other chains might even be completely centralized with a single server that can respond in like 20 milliseconds time. Uh, and for some use cases, this like for this super high frequency uh, training, th- this would be the case. They will re- likely prefer this. But they might still want the full validity and security derived from Ethereum and open, you know, being not an isolated chain, but a part of the bigger ecosystem with uh, all this rich liquidity. So that, that so that's your first uh, bottleneck. And as you can see, like the various trade-offs lead to various different solutions. Your second trade-off uh, it, or bottleneck is going to be your the data availability, how you store data availability, or how you manage data availability. If you are a ZK rollup then you are competing with all the other rollups on Ethereum, ZK and Optimistic for the block space because the block space of Ethereum is limited. It's kind of a zero sum game. If some blockchain, is, if some rollups will get more data, there will be less uh, data, um, not data, data availability bandwidth available to other rollups. Uh, so, which will lead then just to higher prices for, for this data bandwidth. So this is a big problem and the only way to solve it in the short term, to make the the throughput really unlimited, is to use external data availability, like off-chain data availability. So you will still have ZK rollups, and maybe every chain should have a part of uh, its account in on the ZK rollup, where all the data is published on Ethereum, and you, they enjoy high security. But for the accounts that do not need high security or are willing to take some risks into account you want to publish data availability externally. With zero knowledge proofs, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot less sense with optimistic approaches, which we can discuss why. Uh, but for uh, uh, for or ops, it works. So if you can go and you have this kind of elastic extension of data availability bandwidth, then this bottleneck is going to be solved for you. And the third bottleneck we have is the actual ability to generate zero knowledge proofs. And this is the least of our problems because the proof generation is today relatively cheap and we can do it on, um, um, on very broadly available hardware. So the, uh, we, uh, last week we announced an upgrade called Boojam, a new proof system that has been, uh, that, that's going to be embraced by, uh, ZK Sync era. Uh, this is a proof system we've kind of been working on and off for, uh, for a couple of years is based on the, uh, a construction called Redshift, which is just a combination of Plonk uh, and uh, Plonkish arithmetization and Fry polynomial commitment. Uh, and the implementation we have today only requires 6 to 16 gigabytes of RAM. Depending on your configuration, you can, you can choose the parameters. But like, let's say 16. 16 gigabytes of RAM on a GPU 
is basically consumer grade hardware. You can do it on gaming machines. You can do it in, like on a any cloud provider. They have plenty of GPUs available for machine learning for other purposes that you can utilize. So we will be able to prove all of the world's web transactions with with ZK using like something like, like this. So that that is not really a bottleneck. So data availability and the uh, the, the sequential throughput or like, uh, the sequencer throughput are the really two bottlenecks. And we can talk about the solutions. The solution to the sequencer throughput is to have many chains. There is no alternative for this. Like we will not be able to handle all of the world's value transactions on a single monolithic chain because it just physically invisible. Like you cannot imagine all of the world's internet servers running on a single server or on the, even on a single data center. Like that, 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 that doesn't scale. You need to be able to add more and more on demand. It, it also won't work because different, no matter what configuration you take, you're making some trade-offs. Latency versus decentralization. Like if you if you're a decentralized uh, consensus, then you will naturally be able to handle less throughput and and less like. Um, when when you say uh, decentralization in this context, like what are you talking about? Uh, decentralization of the sequencer. O okay, if you want if you want to decentralize the sequencer as opposed to on. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So one validator will be able to handle like really high load with very low latency. If you want to have hundreds of validators, then you naturally have to like make the data available to all of them. You have to reach consensus, which requires at least two rounds of communication between all of them. You probably want them to be like broadly geographically spread, not in the same country, not on the same continent. So like the communication uh, loop becomes larger. Like you, you, you're not getting anywhere like you will be in the in the region of like one second, order of magnitude of one second, maybe half a second. Because then basically you run something like Tenement or something like that. Or... Correct, Tenement, the hot stuff. Uh, like you need, like even with uh, the newest modification of hot stuff, you need two rounds of consensus, uh, two rounds of messaging uh, for for the consensus, which means you have to like just send the message twice between different continents, and you so you're just limited by the speed of light and the speed of communication those networks to like which will determine the the latency of your consensus which you can eliminate if you're using a, like a localized uh, data server for uh, for the centralized sequence right so those trade-offs are impossible to make like once and for all one size fits all right so you will need multiple chains and so the question is how do we incorporate multiple chains in an architecture where they can still seamlessly trustlessly and capital efficiently communicate with each other. And this is where the hyperchain architecture comes into play. This is why we, we, we've been working so hard on uh, on making this architecture available in, um, in the ZK Sync network. And like, we would love to make it available to other rollups as well. But unfortunately, the way Ethereum is architected, um, it's not going to be as seamless between different rollup ecosystems. It's like, you will be able to pass messages between, say, ZK Sync, like one of the ZK Sync chain hyperchains, and like one of the Starkware, uh, Starknet itself, or one of the L3s. So there will be some degree of trustlessness, but it's not going to be as seamless in terms of assets movement. To move an asset from one rollup to another, you will either need to use external liquidity, or you will have to go through layer one and actually pass the uh, this asset from one like bridge contract on Ethereum, which belongs to ZK Sync, to the bridge contract on Ethereum, which belongs to some other rollup, which will make Ethereum layer one itself the bottleneck of this bridging, which will not really scale for like we're talking about millions or billions of users. But within the ecosystem, with inside the ZK Sync uh, hyperchain network, it will be possible. In, to arbitrary degree. So like the, the way you can imagine hyperchains is just like um, like you have like domains for email. You have Brian at Epicenter or Gmail or whatever. I have like Alex at MatterLabs.com. You can send an email from any address on any domain to any other address on any other domain. And you don't have to care about it. You, you don't, you know, you're like the, the communication is the same. You just do one click 
And in a few seconds or minutes, the, uh, the message arrives on, on the other side. And it's end-to-end -end encrypted, like, you know, it, it's trustless. How does this work technically? Because basically um, one, um, uh, one ZK sync chain would have to know the state of the other chain to actually make this happen, right? So basically it's kind of like the old problem of kind of having smart shards and how they communicate, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you want to learn like real technical detail, like deep technical details on how it works, I highly recommend this slosh paper where the, uh, the slosh team has done an extensive research and documented really well how, how this will work. But like the high level, yes, the two chains that transact uh, between each other need to share, need to have access to each other's state. So this is already possible with all rollups on Ethereum. The moment you finalize a state on one rollup, you can use storage proofs to to access the state of any other rollup because you can go like a best. Uh, you, like you, you can imagine that Ethereum kind of unites all of the states of all the rollups in one huge Merkle tree, where Ethereum state tree is is like the the, the top of our, our, of this huge Merkle tree. Uh, so what you do is on the one chain you commit a message with a destination of some other chain. And in this message, you say, here, I I like, I am burning, let's say 100 ETH on this chain here. Like the smart contract takes care of this. And so like, I promise, I, I like, I, I, I burn it in favor of this destination on, on some other hyper chain uh, within some period of time. And you make this commitment, you store it in storage. The other chain can then read the storage and say, oh, I see that this amount was burned. And here's a very, very important part. Because both chains run the exactly same subset of circuits, the exactly same subset of like cryptographic enforcement of, of the rules. I can trust this other chain with a message that for with this commitment that the, the, this action has actually been performed, that they actually burned this 100 ETH. I can trust it blindly because that chain is, is like the, its validity is enforced by exactly the same circuits as my own chain, as, as, I, as myself, as, as, as I myself as a chain, right? So like for me, like, I, I can trust that chain as much as I can trust myself. So I can easily mint this 100 ETH on this chain, like through some system counter that, that has access to like minting, and it's probably going to be like a part of the, of your bridging, like, you know, you, your tokens will have to be aware if you either use system contracts for tokens or you use specialized tokens that know the, about this functionality, can mint this, uh, this assets, and then you can use this assets natively. So like the, you need to be part of the same state. You need to have the same circuit so they can trust each other. And then the third key component of, of this architecture is that all of these chains have to share a single bridge on Ethereum that holds assets for them. Because if you don't share the, the same bridge for, that holds the assets, then you can kind of like trust the other chain. You can know, you can be sure that they burned some like 100 ETH and you can mint it yourself inside your chain but you will never be able to withdraw this 100 ETH because they don't belong to you. They're not blocked in your in your bridge on Ethereum. Is is that last one the main reason why you wouldn't be able to get the same kind of convenience when it comes to like bridging to Starknet or some other thing? Uh, precisely, yes. Like you, you, you like in order. So like there would be a question if you can trust Starknet contracts because it's a separate ecosystem that is managed by entirely different governance. You might like you know. Like, you will have to write your specialized contract, the custom user contract that says, I trust Starknet. Maybe other contracts don't, but I do trust them. So like, I can believe that this message is real. But then, like, so the, 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 that's actually the first problem. Like, even if we if we could manage the, 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 um, the, the ownership of this 100 ETH, this contract would not be able to persuade the system contract that we should mint 100 ETH because the system contract does not know if Starknet is not compromised by their governance. Because the system contract basically is able to verify the computation that's done using specific circuits and Starknet has different circuits so it like cannot 
directly verified. Correct. It, it's just a different system, not not governed by the same like upgradability pattern, by the same code. So like the system the system contract can only trust other system contracts of trusted origin. It cannot trust users' code. Because if, if I can deploy arbitrary smart contract which says, mint me $1 million, trust me, bro. Uh, it's like, it's it's honest because it's kind of from the other chain. The system contract will say, you know, like maybe, maybe not. So it, it has to be a message that comes from the other system contract that actually burned this, this 100 deep. But yes, but then the second part is 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 we, you're right. Like even if we if we solve that, we like on the system level we make an agreement. We say like zk sync trusts Darknet. Darknet trusts zk sync. We still cannot pass the uh, the assets because they they are locked in different uh, underlying bridge contracts. How does the hyperchain know which other chains are in the hyperchain architecture and to trust them? Right. I mean, they kind of need a hyperchain ID. That kind of says I am hyperchain seventy two. Uh, you can trust me. But is is there any way of kind of faking that, or do you need a centralized register? How 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 do you go about that? You will have a smart contract on Ethereum that will hold the Merkle tree of the uh, um, of the hyperchains. Let's call it the shared prover the sh or the shared verifier. In this Merkle tree. All the state changes will only be authorized if they are coming from a trusted hyperchain. And by, by trusted, I mean like from a hyperchain with the uh, circuits that the prover contract knows. Because the prover contracts are always verifies the proofs against some verification keys. Yeah, like, so like when you verify a proof, you need to know what you verify. You don't like, you need to have this commitment to the circuits, which we call the verification key. It's a small key, but it 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 uh, unambiguously identifies certain cryptographic program. One circuit always produces one specific verification. So the so this bridge contract will have like one single verification key for all the hyperchains. Any hyperchain that wants to make a state transition must support this verification, which means that they are enforcing all the rules the way. We all agreed that we will enforce. And this is also how you make sure that the um, the tokens on each hyperchain are actually commensurate, right? Because basically, I could be a evil hyperchain and could say, "Look, I have a hundred ETH. I will burn it. I will reissue it in, on hyperchain 19. and then basically I burn uh, some sort of fake ether and kind of get real ether on hyperchain nineteen. Absolutely correct. So they have to to share the circuits. Maybe not all the circuits. The hyperchains are actually highly customizable. They are, they are fully sovereign. You can choose your sequencer. You can choose your data availability model. You can choose your extensions, whatever you want. But there must be a, some really small subset of circuits that enforce this integrity, that enforce this uh, um, the, the asset treasury that like, really everyone cannot mess with anyone uh, else's assets. So this part must be common, and this is going to be the, 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 the critical part to verify in the state transition. I think I think I get, get that part now. Let's maybe back up a little, kind of to the four requirements of a ZK rollup. So um, as we as we talked about earlier, you kind of you need you need uh, regular checkpoints that can't revert. You need a proof between checkpoint to checkpoint. Then you need data availability, and the reason why you need data availability is so that if there is no data availability, there's like some sort of secret transaction that I can kind of include in the block. Um, other people can no longer calculate the current state of the block and can no longer build on it, and thereby I can effectively uh, brick it. Right? I can kind of I can't steal Freeze funds. It. Yeah, but I I can I can make sure that no one else can do anything because I have the secret transaction. This is why you need the data availability. There are validiums. Uh, which are basically ZK rollups without data availability. And this is kind of uh, the direction that Celo uh, is going as well as Polygon and so on. How do you th think about this spectrum of l 2 And do you think maybe there's even a way of kind of doing data availability optimistically? So that basically don't actually, because basically if you, if you look at how much you spend on the checkpoints versus on the data availability. Um, maybe you can give us the exact numbers for ZK Sync, 
but um, almost everything actually is is for data availability rather than the the checkpoints, right? Uh, absolutely correct. So I'll start with this last question. Indeed, the like, uh, absolute majority of the uh, costs is going towards data availability. From like we currently have 30, 50 cents per transaction, depending on fluctuating uh, gas price in Ethereum uh, across all rollups. The, the bulk of this cost is going to data availability. And it's not going to change even after EAP 4844, which will hopefully bring the costs down by a factor of 10x, maybe 20x. But like the, even the remaining one cent is going to be the majority of the cost because the zero knowledge pros um, computation part is tiny. It's like 0, 0.0 something. Like, you need, like it's hard to calculate exactly because there are many components in the system. Like it, it's it's really like you can benchmark something. Um, in, in vacuum, but it's it, in detection from the real system, it, it's not going to be indicative, but like we know for sure it, it's like a tiny part. So correct, the data availability is important. So if you want to lower the costs, you have to seek this external data availability solutions, like the, the building something like Validiums uh, or Volutions. Talk about that in a second. Um, the, the, like, let's reason about their l 2s -ness. I think we need a good definition of what an L2 actually is. Uh, and I, I've, I've not seen a strict definition adopted by the community. Like we kind of like know it uh, intuitively, but, but not precisely. I think a good definition would be an L2 is a chain that derives its security from uh, uh, underlying layer one. Like security in, in various senses, like it could be aliveness, could be security of funds, the retrievability of the funds eventually. And so on, but like you need to derive some security from L1. If if you don't derive security, like like for 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 like some significant security from from L1. So a, a side chain, for example, is not uh, an L2 because your security entirely depends on your set of validators. They can do whatever they want with your money. If they collude, they can steal. They can they can freeze. They whatever. With zk rollup, the security is hundred percent derived from layer one. You can always guarantee that the users will eventually be able to withdraw all the funds, no matter what the validators. If the contracts are immutable, if they if they don't have the right to arbitrarily change contracts, and of course if there are no bugs in the implementation, which is a significant risk, which is not negligible. But like let's assume those two, two factors for now. Uh, in this case, ZK rollup is like ironclad security is is exactly the same as Ethereum in in, in terms of its properties. The Validium is in between. All the transactions in Validium are enforced by uh, by zero knowledge proofs and Ethereum. So it's not possible to make anything invalid. It's not possible to execute something not on behalf of the user. So in this sense, it derives a very significant part of its security from Ethereum. And for some use cases, you really you don't care that much about data availability. You only care about the um, the correctness of the code. Like an example of this would be, let's say, online voting. Let's say that like you're voting. Like let's ignore censorship resistance for now. Let's let's imagine that we have some like perfect censorship resistant input, because maybe like you know like what, what like each party collects their own votes, and then each party submits their like you know like we we have like. You know, blue party and the red party, both of them get as many votes as they can from their respective uh, proponents, and then each of them submits a transaction on this chain, and all you care about is to calculate the votes correctly, and then you want to publish the result on chain, and, but you want to make sure that it's actually like correctly available on chain to other contracts, not not just to humans to demonstrate, which you could do off chain just generating zero knowledge proofs. You want to make, make it available to contracts. So for this, data availability is really not important. All you care about in the end is that the result is correct, right? The same applies to, to oracles. Like if when, when you do oracle updates, you don't care about the state of the oracle update because you can, you can discard that. Like if the, if, the, if the chain is frozen, who cares? Like you will be able to make new oracle ticks on the new chain when, when users migrate. Right, like so, but what you care about is that the Oracle updates have been correctly verified, that they're coming from trusted sources, that the weighted averages are computed correctly, and so on and so on. Right, so for those use cases, 
Validium does not constitute any reduction in security because they, they, you only use security for computation, which it's, it, it, it's perfectly secure. So from this perspective, I think that Validium is actually, like it should deserve to be called ML2 to some degree. When we talk about the actual like real life security, like real world security for the user assets, it becomes a lot trickier. It's really hard to reason. Like we now we are back to this game theoretical a plane where we can imagine that the operator, the validators of this validium chain that locks a lot of like you know, some billions of dollars of user assets, they could say, Oh, you know what? Like let's try to blackmail our users, let's freeze the state and then like demand ransom. Or maybe they don't uh, uh, freeze the state, maybe they are hacked. Because the the servers that operate the validium have to be on uh, online. They, they, the keys have to be on the hot machines. So maybe there is some like ingenious way to hack the systems and they like, compromise the majority of the uh, of the validators, and then the hackers can demand ransom. You know, like it, it it could potentially become tricky. So I would of course treat validium accounts always as like significantly less secure than Ethereum accounts. But then. You know, like you, you could like the the I think the the ideal solution is the combination of both. When you have something like a volution system, where you as a user can decide for each of your accounts, do you want it to be stored on Ethereum, like on uh, you know on a ZK rollup with full Ethereum security guarantees, but maybe higher cost of transactions on this account, and for some other account, you 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 decide that it should be a, a validium or you know, is a key partner account where the data availability is secured off chain by some committee with some economic security, but you use it as you would use your savings and your current account. You would keep most of your assets, most of your savings on the savings account. Maybe you put them in some DeFi protocols from your rollup account and you don't touch it every day, right? You only transact rarely on it. So like most of your value is there. And then you move some of this value to your current account on the on the validium side of uh, of the volution, let's say on, on like you you on, on ZK Sync it would be called ZK Porter. So you put it in ZK Porter. Maybe you have like your millions of dollars and on, on that side and just a few thousand per month to pay for for your uh, daily needs on the volution side. And so you kind of like you you explicitly manage the risks of this exposure. And if everyone else is doing the same, then you have a lot less value locked on the uh, Validium side of the evolution, but you will have a lot more transactions, which actually makes a perfect sense from the from this balance perspective, right? Like you will have a lot of cheap transactions, a lot of trading going on there, a lot of like uh, computational activity like uh, Oracle updates uh, and uh, arbitrage transactions and so on and so on happening on, on the Evolution side. Uh, sorry, on, on the Validium side. Can I quickly kind of question this to a certain extent. Basically, if you kind of look how, say, Cello is transitioning to uh, being an L2, they're not foregoing their validator set, right? So while kind of um, CK Sync, and to be fair, all other L2s have like a centralized sequencer, which is definitely also an attack vector, right? Um, the, the validiums that kind of we see emerging, they already have a decentralized validator set. Um, so basically, there's many entities that in principle are allowed to kind of build the blocks. Where do you see the trade-off here? So, I mean, obviously, if you could, if you had a decentralized sequencer on ZK Sync, this, this point would kind of fall. But currently, you don't, right? Uh, you can't really compare the two. So, for, first of all, we, we are committed to decentralizing the sequencer. We are actively working on this. We have a prototype, uh, which we'll unveil very soon. It's it's running on the hot stuff. Uh, consensus, it, it's going to be fully decentralized as a sequencer. Uh, and what you want to get from the sequencer decentralization primarily is the uh, the resilience and the liveness of your network. You want to be sure that the network will remain operational like for everyday transactions, even if one or, or multiple parties are compromised or going down or unavailable for whatever reasons. But the sequencer does not affect the security of your funds. So you could, you could argue that liveness is part of security. I will admit that. But if you put a lot of value in some DeFi applications, yes, you will be annoyed if it's if it's not available, and you might have some like opportunity costs uh, for for not being able to use it for a couple of days. 
but it's nothing compared to the uh, to the to the ability to lose all of your funds locked in, like in Uniswap, for example. Right? But but the validators can't steal from you, right? I mean, so basically, if if you have the ability to kind of run your own full node, you can't be duped about the state of of the chain. You you can never steal funds. Yeah, you can never steal funds. Like all you could try to do is like. The validators could could try to double like they can can't even do a double spend like they they can only do some short term uh, faking on chain that will never finalize on Ethereum. And if you if you you're, you're making high value transactions, you always want to wait for the final fin like for for the finality on Ethereum for the checkpoint that actually guarantees that this transaction is final before accepting it. If you're expecting someone like for someone a payment of one million dollars. You have to wait for Ethereum final. You cannot trust the sequencer to just, oh, I have a confirmation. Absolutely. But that's the same on Validium, right? So on Validium, the validators or like the, your, your guardians of data, the data availability providers can actually freeze your state, can freeze the entire chain. And so your value will become unavailable to you. You need only a single honest validator, right? Because you only no, no, need no, one no, person no, no. who it, kind of makes the data available. Great question. Like this is a big misconception about the data availability systems. The like, if you have a state transition which has been authorized by a decentralized set of validators, and at least one of them is honest, that will apply. This one honest validator will share the data with you. However, if the majority of your validator set is compromised. Let's say like two thirds of the validator set is malicious. Then they will do a state transition without sharing it with any of the honest validators. So even though you have one third of the honest validators on the chain, they will never get a single bit of this data from the malicious parties. So it's like the, what matters is like who controls the state transition, not who controls the data uh, for, 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 for the honest blocks. Because if you control the state transition ability, then you can always make the state transition into this unavailable state. And it doesn't matter that you have like a lot of honest people in, on, on the chain. Okay, so you need more than one third honest majority. Or uh, the other Some way around? Some quorum, like it, it, the chain yeah. can decide, is it like one, like 50%, uh, two thirds, whatever, but like some quorum, the, the, this quorum that decides that, yes, we can accept the state transition because we like the... The, um, the smart contract on Ethereum has to make a decision whether this block has data available or not. And it's, it's impossible to, like, for, for, for this block to, uh, sorry, for, for this contract to tell it subjectively. It cannot talk to all the validators. It cannot, like, make data availability sampling because it's a smart contract. It can only work with a limited amount of data that it's been tested. So the, uh, the, the what, what, the contract can verify is like, okay, do I have enough signatures? Do I have a quorum of signatures? Let's say two thirds. It's a limitation of this verification contract. Okay, yeah, that that totally that clears up my question. Um, so if you look at kind of how DK Sync and all other L tools are implemented at the moment, they're all upgradable, usually from a single multi sig, right? So I un I totally understand why this is done. So you need to be able to mitigate potential vulnerabilities and and on top of that L1 hasn't really ossified enough so there might be upgrades on L1 that kind of might actively break things on L2 um, so how how do you then mitigate kind of the risk of compromised key attacks right because say there's like 20 percent uh, 20 people on your on your committee and you need like you know 10 signatures for upgrading the contract in if allowing you to steal funds and so on like act actually sealing fund, the funds, not just freezing them. H how, how do you mitigate that risk? This is a great question. Uh, and this is something like if you if you you would ask me like how I feel about this upgradability, I would say I feel terrible. Like I, I uh, we, we the at ZK Sync, the very first version of the protocol we deployed is of uh, ZK Sync version one, which is now called ZK Sync Lite. It was completely immutable. It was immutable with some upgrade period because we could not tolerate that. Like the the, the idea that some multi sig can control upgradability or the team can control upgradability and just propose arbitrary changes completely defeats the idea of this trustless scaling, right? So like the, the, 
that was something we were uh, uh, we were finding disgusting. And then we had to learn the hard way that like we're w- way too early. We have to make the um, uh, we have to react to all vulnerabilities because the bugs will be found in the short term. Uh, while the system is in development, so you have to think. You have to take a very paranoid, defensive uh, mindset with e- mechanisms of defense in depth, where you have multiple layers of protection, and you should be able to react uh, react in a timely manner to threats. So we came up with the idea of the security council, and since then, it, like the the second chain that embraced the security council was Arbitron earlier this year. And now it's it's a uh, it's a broadly uh, popular idea that like all, m- most other chains are embracing, and Vitalik and L two B they are making great effort to to push for it to to set some high bar of standards of what constitutes a true security council. So let's look at how security council works. A team should only be able, like the core team of of any protocol, should only be able to propose a change for the uh, upgrade which will execute with some time lock so that the users have time to withdraw from the protocol if they don't like the change or if outright the protocol looks malicious. Now, if you deal with an emergency, if there is an open bug on your system on live smart contracts, you want to be able to accelerate this and this is where Security Council would kick in and you would get some external people maybe appointed by the governance of your protocol, like hopefully or ideally, a broad set of participants of highly reputable people from the community, from a lot of different jurisdictions, who use off-chain cold wallets to control these keys. So what it gives you is the protection from a uh, regulatory capture. Like it's a lot harder to compromise people in different jurisdictions because, like now, it has to be something universal. If if one government goes wrong and and tries to like hijack the protocol. They will not be able to do it. Like if 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 a, if a single company controls the protocol, then the government of the company where the company is incorporated would come to them and say like, make this upgrade or or you go to jail. It's not like this, right? But if 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 we have a like a broad set of participants, then it's much less likely because it's harder. The second protection it gives you is that compromising a lot of cold wallets in the hardware wallets or air gap machines or something like highly secured is a lot harder than compromising the uh, online servers with hot keys in memory that are probably running in some cloud providers that have access to the internet that are vulnerable to zero days to compromise the, 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 the cold wallets that are not connected to the internet someone would have to go and break into like all of the uh, multi-sig participants, which is a lot, a lot harder. But it's still not a, not a perfect solution. And uh, the perfect solution would be to bypass the need to, like, to, to withdraw the rights of upgrades from both the team and the security council altogether. So the, I can imagine a world where the security council appointed by the governance, broadly decentralized, highly secured with uh, cold keys, can only freeze the protocol for a short period of time if they see an emergency. If there is a, a bug that, ha- that needs a treatment, they should go and do this, and then they should bring this question to the protocol governance, and the protocol governance should decide and then make appropriate changes and, and make the emergency upgrades on the protocol. And then, even in this case, the question is like, what is governance? Is it just the majority of the token holders? Is it some broader set of participants? Like, you know, like I, I really admire, I, I want to make a shout out to the Optimism team for for doing a lot of work on, on, the, on the process of governance, like um, elaborating different schemes. Like they have the idea of the house of citizens, the house, house of token holders. You have a, a consensus between both of them. And even then, we might have some better mechanisms such as like, eventually bringing up this question to the consensus of layer one, uh, you know, maybe initiating a an upgrade in a way that can only be accomplished with the soft fork of layer one itself. If there is a disagreement between different parties of uh, uh, of these governing entities. So th- this is a big question which requires a lot more research, but I, I hope I, I could add some flavor. Cool. No, that was very helpful. 
So one question that I think is kind of like very connected to this. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the risk of bugs. I mean, I've also heard of other people being quite concerned about this with regards to ZK rollups. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, where are the risks of, you know, bugs and, uh, and what kind of consequences could we have if there are maybe bugs at different places? Well, all of the rollups are relatively new systems that mean to be bottle tested for a long period of time with a lot of money until we kind of have enough confidence that, that they are secure. The box can happen in various places. Uh, for ZK rollups, they're really, like if you look at the complexity of the systems, the complexity is, um, is bounded to different isolated components. So uh, you could have a bug in cryptography potentially, theoretically, that could allow you to fake proofs. Or you could have a bug in circuits that would allow you to, if you have, like, if, if you are the validator, you can submit any proposal for the new block. You could submit a malicious block and then fake the proof that this block is uh, is actually valid, right? If there are bugs, if, if you forgot some constraints, if some things are, are missing in, in the circuit. So to mitigate these things, it's, it's, it's actually a lot easier to do in ZK rollups than, let's say, in optimistic rollups. Because you can create redundant systems. Like the way we, it works in, in all mission critical systems today with like life uh, emergencies, aviation, nuclear energy, and so on, you never rely on a single component for security or for safety for that matter. Like in the aviation, you always have like multiple engines and multiple sensors. The same thing can apply here. You don't want to rely just on the validity proofs. You want to do things like 2FA, where you need two separate mechanisms. In, 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 in the case of Fiziki rollup, for example, it would be first a consensus of the validators has to agree on, on that the block is valid, and only then they produce the zero knowledge proofs, and Ethereum contract verifies both the signatures of the majority of the validators and the easier knowledge proof, and only if both match, then you make a state transition. So now, if there is a bug in cryptography, it's you. In addition to to breaking cryptography, you have to compromise the majority of the validators, which is hard, because most likely they they were honest to begin with, and then it it will be hard. You would you would have to buy a lot of stake to be able to get to this critical quorum. But then, in addition to that, if you introduce some things like withdrawal delays as we have in ZK Sync era, for example, like the, the delays are withdrawed, uh, uh, um, the, the withdrawals are delayed by a few hours, in addition to just verifying the, the proof, you could say that, well, like, you, you would also need to compromise the security council, who would be able to spot the problem and freeze the contract before the new malicious state transition is compromised, which will bring you to 3FA. And then in, like you can add one more layer of protection. You can say that in addition to the validators and zero knowledge proofs and this kind of fraud proof monitoring by the security council, we would require a trusted execution environment like SJX, for example, proof that the state transition is valid. It would give you like four layers of protection that you have to bypass. And you don't have to rely on Intel or, uh, or NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA or uh, other providers for this. Like if the... SGX become uh, proofs become unavailable, then the governance can always intervene and just switch them off. This would be something. So, like you, you would always have kind of a multi sig of several different uh, components with a uh, growing degree of complexity of breaking that for security. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks for explaining that. So maybe a final topic we wanted to touch on, which is that. One thing that's being discussed a lot, which right, is the, the sequencer and the decentralization of sequencers. I mean, it, it sounds like if I get sort of the ZK sync path correctly, right, is that you basically want to have the technologies to allow, you know, like lots of different people to do lots of ZK rollups and to choose, uh, to choose sort of whether they want centralized sequencer or decentralized sequencer and maybe different types of parameters. So are you, is, as a result, is that correct? And then for the path of, okay, I want a decentralized sequencing solution, 
are you guys building a decentralized sequencer and you know how what's that what does that look like uh this is a correct statement we are focused now on the zk stack so we're uh, it, which is based on the source code of uh, zk sync era and uh, this is a modular framework this is a framework where you can replace different components from the sequencer to the uh um, data availability layer to, to the way you handle MEV, like all, all of these things are going to be customizable for you and you have the full freedom to choose what components you, you use in what way. Uh, but we have to provide the basic components, uh, which some of them we are working uh, on at Meta Labs. Some will be provided by the community, some will be provided by the grants program that, that we, uh, we want to initiate. But Sequencer is really fundamental it's it's one of the most important parts of the uh of the stack and this is something we definitely want for the for for era we don't want era to remain a chain with centralized sequencer we want to go to 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 decentralize it in all aspects as soon as we possibly can so we are actively working on a decentralized consensus as i said before we're uh we're, we're using hot stuff uh, or, or a modification of hot stuff called Hotshot for it, uh, which gives you a very decent throughput at, at, at a very decent latency. So for, for, for ZK Sync, we always take the user needs as the you know, like, as, as the, like the, the, the North Star of where we want uh, the architecture to go. Like we always architect back from the ideal user experience we envision. And the ideal user experience is that every transaction confirms almost instantly, like within under one second, and it costs like under one cent. So that, that's kind of the, 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 um, the utopia, the crypto utopia that we want to build. And from this perspective, the, the consensus has to be fast. Decentralized, but fast enough and low latency enough. And uh, Hotshot was was meeting these criteria, uh, criteria, so it became our choice. So, so just to clarify this here, the consensus here. So it's basically like, how does that work? Does it basically mean you have a, a kind of like in proof of stake that let's say there is someone that's kind of like the leader at this point who does the sequencing and then a, a bunch of data together gets passed around and others kind of using hot stuff they test the validity or like the correctness of it and and then that's confirmed and then you go to the next leader or is hot stuff just used to basically choose the sequencer and then for some point you know you just have this one party that's a sequencer or like how does that work uh so the uh, the blocks are being produced roughly every second and it every second the 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 the, the leaders decide that and, and the all of the validators reach consensus on what's the next block and it's okay. Byzantine full okay. tolerance so like if you the if the leader again you know, like if some of the participants go down or become unresponsive it, it will uh self-repair quickly but every second we have a decision yeah yeah okay every se and then do you feel like all of these things that are like huge topics at the moment on ethereum you know like around the mev pipeline and you know the proposal builder separation and those kind of things will will the, to what extent will this carry over to uh like this and the kind of decentralized sequencing ck sync rollups uh, this is a really, really good question. I don't have a definitive answer to it. We are in the research phase. We are looking at all the different developments there. We're in touch with the Ethereum Foundation, with uh, with guys building. Uh, like, there are really amazing teams out there being shared sequencers uh, who think that shared sequencing is, is the paradigm for Ethereum. I don't have a firm conclusion yet, like how it will work. I have some concerns, which, which I shared with all of them, about the centralization of power if we come to, uh, to a world where proposal builder separation leads to just a few entities essentially building all of the blocks on all the chains. I think that's a bit dystopian because it will give them a lot of soft power and like you don't want eventually like to like, like, like some 
Google or Facebook or you know uh, something like a big corporation like this to be powering all of the blockchains with nominal decentralization through uh, through solar staking. So we want to design systems that actually encourage decentralization in various regards. But there is a popular opinion uh, that it might not be possible and eventually because of the complexity of MEV extraction and, and the value that you can produce uh, uh, from there, that the, 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 this inherent specialization in, in, in for builders will inevitably lead to this outcome. I don't want to believe this. I want to believe that we will be able to come up with designs that actually broadly decentralize the systems with uh, a lot of individual uh, participants with uh, with uh, with ways to actually mitigate MEV and like it, it to prevent at least toxic MEV from happening like targeted MEV attacks I think there are designs out there that that largely can accomplish this but I, I've also heard concerns of of schemes like encrypted mempools that they they could lead to other problems m m leading to like less efficient uh arbitrage on, on, on such systems and so on. I don't have a definitive answer, but we have a research team focused on this and we will be just trying things out. I can promise you that ZK Sync, that you know, to our core values, and we, we, we have not discussed the ZK Credo yet. But this is like, I encourage everyone to read and contribute to the ZK Credo, which is our mission and philosophy and values statement. We will do everything we can and, and we want our community to enforce it to go in the direction of the maximum decentralization and trustlessness. And so we will just pick the designs for ERA, and I think the, the community will support it, that maximize the decentralization and trustlessness and minimize MEV. Uh, but for hyperchains, I'm sure that we will see a lot of experimentations and people will be trying all the different models with like from going to maximum MEV and then distributing it to the community to trying to minimize MEV and work with like first come first serve principles or encrypted mempools or some other novel approaches, which I'm not aware of. And eventually the market will decide what works best. I wish we could go on because uh, lots of these actually sound super interesting, but we are already way over time. So we'll just have to have you back at some point. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Uh, it was uh, super insightful. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It was a very interesting conversation. Thank you for a great question. Thank you so much.